Good, okay. Good, we've got another, another minute or two, that's good. Good, well, good morning, everybody. Um, let, me, uh, let me just say, in these constrained times, I'm overwhelmed at how many benches have been filled up, notwithstanding the seats that don't work, but it's all good to see you again. <laughs> and thank you for your loyalty. I recognize lots of familiar faces, and thank you. The um, course this year is a bit of a challenge, I think. And is that too dark, or are you OK for making notes? It's, we'll see the slides rather better if that's acceptable to you. And the other thing, if you can't hear me for any reason, just shoot up a hand or shout something out, because it's important that we communicate. So the course then, Artistic and Cultural Cross Currents, I think has never been more relevant in time than it is today, in the era of conflict and me and everything else and the political situation we face in many countries around the world. And perhaps it can be subtext, the subtitle for the course might be to paraphrase the 17th century English uh, poet John Donne, no man is an island entire unto himself. And today, to be politically correct, that would apply to the subject of today's talk, Frida Kahlo, and of course her husband, uh, Diego Rivera. And here she is. An iconic figure, I think you'll all recognize, certainly the younger generation is more familiar with this face than of the Mona Lisa. And there she is, a Mexican artist, 20th century, hair piled up high, and her hallmark eyebrows, eyebrows meeting in the middle of her forehead there. So I'll try to keep my head steady. And she's also a, a tragic figure in the many way that Van Gogh is uh, revered uh, as much for the tragedy of his life as for his art. And so it was with Frida, who at the age of six had polio, which left her with a limp. And then at the age of 18, uh, traveling in a school bus back home from school, the bus was in a wooden bus was in a collision with a tram car, which smashed into it at high speed, crushing her against the railing, smashing her pelvis, her lower limbs and arm and her spine. And she was in pain for much of her life, dying young at the age of 47. She was conflicted, and this is the theme of the course, the conflict between one origin and another origin. And she was conflicted at one moment seeing herself firmly rooted in the soil of her native Mexico, and at another moment seeing herself as two Fridas, a European Frida because of her father's ancestry coming from Europe on the right, and she could also feel pulsating through her veins the blood of the native Mexicans that came to her from her maternal, her paternal, maternal grandfather. She was also famous for marrying the most famous Mexican painter at the time, where she was still young. At the age of 22, she married Diego Rivera, who was the most famous Mexican muralist still today. And she had another conflict, not only with her racial and national identity coming from settler stock from Spain as part of the Spanish conquest, the Native American, Nate Mexican blood that ran through her veins, but another conflict for her was living in the shadow of this great man and trying to assert herself as an artist in her own right. This is her father. He was Hungarian, Kahlo is a Hungarian name, and after spending some time in Germany at the age of 19, he emigrated uh, to Mexico. And he was a cultured man, he practiced as a photographer to earn his living, but was a cultured man and had a large library. And above his desk, he had a photograph of the German philosopher um, Schopenhauer. Her mother was a devoutly religious uh, Catholic, Frieda describing her later as suffocatingly so, and uh, there was conflict between them, although she was devoted to her father for all of his life. And here she is in this photograph. She's the third of four siblings, four sisters, and that's Frida on the right there. And you can see she's leaning a little bit to one side uh, with her limp. Her polio kept her in hospital in those days, in bed rather, in those days for a full nine months, leaving her with the limp. She was a very bright child at school, however, and at the age of 15, was admitted to the prestigious um, National Preparatory School in Mexico City, which groomed gifted youngsters for entry to the university. 
Moreover, she was only one of 35 girls among a student body of 2,000, mostly boys. She planned to study medicine. But fatefully one day, at the age of 18, she was traveling back, and here's a drawing that she later made of the collision of the tram hitting uh, the bus in which she nearly lost her life. She was in hospital for two months, but she had a feisty spirit, and once she was over the initial pain and the misery of getting everything set and casts, uh, she spent her time reading Proust, Zola, Chinese poetry, and the news accounts of the Soviet Revolution, Bolshevik Revolution of 1917, which had taken place just eight years previously. She went home to convalesce, and there her father fixed her up with a four-poster bed, rigging it up with a mirror so that she could paint herself, giving her a box of oil paints. And that's where her artistic career began, entirely self-taught. <coughs> While she was convalescing and practicing her painting, she received a letter from a friend of hers who'd been on the bus with her, but had escaped unscathed and was now visiting Florence in Italy and was in raptures over the Renaissance painting that he was seeing there. And he encouraged her in the letter to find out all about the Renaissance, which she did. And she went to got the library books on Leonardo da Vinci, discovering his celebrated painting of the lady with the ermine, which you're probably uh, familiar with, and adopted the same pose here in her first of many, many self-portraits, also noting that in the late Renaissance, the mannerist uh, style was coming into fashion with elongated necks and elongated fingers, so she advances herself a little bit there. So a very astute observer of art of the past. Sadly, though, with all her convalescence and surgeries that she had to undergo, university education was, really was going to pass her by because she was unable to take the entrance exam. She did, however, enjoy the dynamic intellectual ferment of all her school friends and spent much time there. And here she's painting one of them, uh, Miguel Lira. There he is in the front there, who became a distinguished uh, Mexican lawyer uh, and uh, poet. Seeing that uh, she was talented, her friends were encouraging her, because medicine was now out of the question, encouraging her to take up art as a career. And she then approached the most famous artist around, of course, which was uh, uh, Rivera, Diego Rivera, who looked at her work and, was, uh, and gave her encouragement, but he was particularly struck by her high intelligence and the fact that as a youngster, having been impressed by the Soviet Revolution, and there had been a Mexican Revolution that had overthrown a colonial-style government, and now a socialist government was prevailing, which she supported wholeheartedly, that he was particularly impressed that she, on her own bat, had joined the Junior League of the Mexican Communist Party, which in the 1920s, of course, was a fashionable thing for many people in Europe to do. And here now she paints herself in a cafe uh, sitting at a, a square table there, but it's a painting within a painting because she was very taken by the fact that in 1910, Mexico had undergone a socialist revolution which lasted for 10 years of guerrilla warfare, culminating in the socialist government which she strongly supported. And there in the back, you can see leaning this large canvas that she's painted within the painting of a mountain, a volcano at the back there, which is uh, uh, belching out uh, smoke, and there in sombreros are the leaders of the Mexican Revolution, Pancho Villa and uh, Emilio Zapata. Purely by chance, a year or so later, she is invited to a cocktail party, and who should be there but Diego Rivera? He had a reputation, he was divorced, he had a reputation for being a serial womanizer, and he was 20 years her senior. Yet there was a, an electric attraction between the two which led them to this uh, tempestuous relationship that we're going to discover in a moment, uh, a lifelong relationship for both of them with ups and downs, to be sure. And this is their official wedding portrait. And there you can see uh, Frida uh, very much identifying herself as a native Mexican here, although she was three quarters Spanish colonial in terms of her blood. And notice how she's arranged her shawl across her chest there, like the bandoliers wearing their um, ammunition for their rifles uh, all across their chests in exactly that manner. 
She was uh, having studied art. She was well aware of Jan van Eyck's uh, famous Arnolfini marriage portrait here from the 14th century. And for their first wedding anniversary, she paints a Renaissance painting to commemorate the marriage with uh, Diego. And here it is, <laughs> this somewhat comical picture here. And there she is, a little, little thing there in her Mexican dress. And there is Diego, and in true Renaissance style, carrying the attru att attributes of his profession, his palette and his brushes in his hand. Her mother was absolutely horrified at the union, and she likened it to a dove marrying an elephant. <laughs> Her father was a bit more sanguine, and he said, well, Diego is at least a famous and wealthy painter, and at least he'll be able to provide for his daughter. A year later, Diego gets a commission to go off to Cuerveca, a provincial town in Mexico, where the conquistador leader, Hernan Cortes, had built a palace, and here is the palace of Cortes in that city, and uh, Rivera was commissioned to paint a history of the Spanish uh, con conquest of Mexico from the conquest until the beginning of the revolution. And he was paint, paint a mural there. And it, the project occupied him for a full two years. And uh, Frida, who was really an amateur painter at this time with no real prospects of advancing and becoming known nationally, let alone internationally, followed him there and was somewhat frustrated while he was working on a grand scale and um, she was uh, not quite sure how to proceed. And then wandering around the churches in Cuernavaca, she came across these little ex voto paintings. They're about 12 inches by about 9 inches, painted on tin in the folk idiom. And what they are, of course, is thank yous to the Virgin Mary for deliverance from some catastrophe that had befallen them. And here, for example, is a boat that had survived a storm, and the surviving fam sailors' families paid to have this painting put in the church, and there it hangs as a thank you. And she was very touched by this. And there she does her own ex photo painting, together with a little legend, in which she gives thanks. She's not at all religious, but she was taken by the charm of these ex photo paintings. And here she depicts that fateful collision between her wooden bus and the tram car there, in which she very nearly died. And again, while Diego is working on the grand scale of murals, she is doing these tiny little things on tin, and here she paints the Mexicans that she sees about her, travelers on a bus. And there we can see a peasant woman, big bulky woman, cradling her baby in her arms, barefoot, bundle at her side. And on the right there, a well-dressed couple, and on the left there, a man in his workers' overalls. In 1931, she accompanies Diego to the United States. He's now commissioned to do five major murals in cities across the United States, starting in New York City, where he was invited to open the uh, one-man show at the recently inaugurated Museum of Modern Art in New York. Having done that, they travel to San Francisco, where he's given a commission uh, to paint a mural for the San Francisco Stock Exchange. At this point, I don't know whether it was known to the uh, Stock Exchange Council that Diego was a fully paid up member of the Mexican Communist Party. <laughs> One of his commissions was in Michigan, in Detroit, the Detroit Institute of Art, and there he was commissioned, and we'll be looking at this in more detail shortly, uh, painting this mural, which will occupy him for another two years' work. And now Frida was struggling to find her own identity. She'd done these little tiny folk paintings. And so while Diego is fully engaged in this massive project here for the uh, uh, atrium, the floral atrium, garden atrium of the uh, Michigan uh, Art Institute, uh, she, with her intelligence and her zest for life and enthusiasm for everything but frustration as an artist, parades herself around Detroit dressed as a, a Mexican artifact with exaggerated Mexican costumes and everyone head turned. So at least she's noticed, but clearly, a sense of frustration. She was not keen to have children, and she had a, underwent a, an abortion, and then three days later had a massive hemorrhage for which she was admitted to the Henry Ford Hospital uh, in Detroit, and there she paints her memories of that horrific experience. There she is in a blood-soaked bed um, where she had uh, curatage to 
uh, deal with the remains of the abortion. Um, and there she is with all the thoughts going through her mind, the aborted fetus and other harrowing images that she carried in her mind. And we'll see these repeatedly coming out in her art. What was her attitude, this member of the Communist League in Mexico, in America, capitalist America? She was ambivalent. At one side, she could appreciate the industry of the Americans and their creativity. And here she paints herself in, Mexi in a Western dress, but holding a Mexican flag and a Mexican folk necklace around her neck. On one side, we can see on the left there, the sun and the moon temple of the Aztecs and the bounty of the earth of Mexico on the left. And there on the right, the fumes belting out of the uh, chimneys and the workers in the factories that she portrays as metallic automatons. So she was, there was a push and pull. And particularly in Detroit during the Depression, she was there in 1933, 1934. During the Depression, she was enraged at seeing the fat cats enjoying themselves in expensive restaurants and drinking champagne while the unemployed were starving and sleeping on the streets. So she had this very strong uh, social context, uh, conscience, as indeed did Diego Rivera. And here again, she does another, another painting and exactly the same theme. You can see the skyline of Manhattan at the back there with the Statue of Liberty on the left and a ship coming into the skyscrapers in lower Manhattan. And there in front, uh, just below that, we can see a temple. And it's a temple in, in Frida's eyes to the god Mammon. On the right, we have a factory in full daylight. And on the left, we can see a church in darkness. And there on the bottom right, we can see a garbage can full of all the things Americans throw out, overspilling. And then two columns, the things that Americans in her eyes hold dear, a gold trophy for something, and then satirically she puts a toilet bowl on the other side. <laughs> and she calls this, this painting, My Dress Hangs There. And there's her Mexican dress. She's present, but she's absent. This ambiguity, the push and pull of the two cultures. So not only does she have the, the cross current of her racial identity, this national and economic conflict that she has between prosperity, poverty, and uh, exploitation, as we'll see. At the end of their four-year sojourn in America, uh, Diego now uh, builds a, a double house, one for her, the blue house here, Casa Azul, and next to it is a pink and white larger house for Diego, uh, for him to do his preparatory work for his uh, murals, and it's in the San Miguel district of Mexico City, which is a very wealthy uh, suburb. But things are not going well in their marriage. Uh, he's, uh, uh, she discovers that Diego, all this time, had been having an affair with Christina, her oldest sister. And he confronts uh, Diego with that, and she paints this painting really to commemorate the, the, the turmoil that was going through her mind at this discovery. But let it be said that she was no angel either. And she had been having an affair with a Japanese painter uh, on her own as revenge for having discovered this about her husband. So there was this dynamic between them which persisted all their life. And then euphemistically above it, she hangs a banner suspended by a dove and a blackbird. And the banner reads in Spanish, um, a couple of small nicks. And there she is, blood spattered everywhere all over the frame of the picture, as you can see. But she was also having health issues. She had her appendix out at this time, and also two of her toes on her right foot were amputated. And that's why in this picture she's wearing a shoe. And the reason for the amputation was that the severity of the injury to her pelvis had damaged the blood supply to her right lower limb, which was just struggling along to survive. And now she had gangrene in her toes as a consequence of this accident. So there she is, feisty as ever, but things are not going well as far as her health is concerned. They separated after this, as you could imagine, and yet the magnetism was such between them that within the year they were reconciled and back together again. What about communism and socialism uh, for Frida? There she is, painted the conflict again between traditional Aztec pre-conquest life. And this is a page from her sketchbook, as you can see. On the right-hand side, the sun and the moon temple of the Aztecs. And there she paints herself, yo in Spanish, I. This is me. But she puts a question mark by it, not quite certain of her identity even yet. 
She had no doubts, though, about her affiliation to the Communist Party, and there, even when the horrors of Stalinism were beginning to become apparent, as she was steadfastly loyal to the uh, people there. Her husband was also a member of the Communist Party, 20 years her senior, but he had temporarily been expelled for his support for Leo, Leon Trotsky. Trotsky, you may remember, was the intellectual member of the first Politburo after the 1917 revolution, when the Soviet Union was formed in 1922, as we'll be talking about on Thursday. Trotsky was the, the, the standard barrier for Marx and Engels' theoretical communism, as opposed to the aberration of communism that the Soviet Union ultimately became. But Stalin regarded him as a prime enemy, and he was excluded, he was expelled, and now, in 1937, he was fear fearful for his life because Stalin was ruthless about dealing with his enemies, as I'm sure you know. And Diego then receives a letter from some colleague, painter colleagues in Moscow whom he had befriended. He'd visited Moscow on several times, being sympathetic to the regime at the time. And the colleagues in Moscow had written to him saying, could you please intercede with the president of Mexico in order to grant Leo Trotsky uh, um, asylum? because he was now fearful for his life. And Diego was successful in that. The president granted Leon Trotsky asylum, and he came with his wife Natalia and lived with Frida Kahlo and Diego Rivera in their house in San Miguel in Mexico City for 15 months uh, before, sorry, before going off into his own apartment here uh, in a neighboring district. And then in August 1940, he. Leo Trotsky goes to the door, answers the door, and there is a man in a mask with a an axe who hacks him to death. And that was the death of Leo Trotsky in Mexico City in 1940. The police then do a sweep and, moment and temporarily arrest Frida Kahlo. Why? Because they suspected this was a crime of passion and that she had paid somebody to assassinate her lover because they had indeed been having an affair. So this fidelity of uh, uh, Diego, or lack of it, uh, was certainly, it was a two-way street. But now she's becoming recognized as a painter. She's finding herself doing self-portrait after self-portrait. And then she has a visit uh, from uh, André Breton, the leader of the Surrealists, who promises her a show in Paris. Uh, it took a long time to come about, but, but he took back with him this painting that Frida did of herself as something of a Madonna. You can see that she has this intense um, self-regard, and here she paints herself as a Mexican Madonna. It's shown in a gallery in Paris, and a curator from the Louvre Museum sees it and purchases it. Purchases it. it becomes the first Mexican painting in the Paris Louvre collection. And now she paints, again, wrestling with this racial identity that she has. She paints herself now, you can see in the courtyard of this blue house, the original Casa Azul of her parents, 10 years old, naked there, and she paints it from her conception, which you can see down towards the bottom left-hand corner there. There she is being fertilized, and she's been fertilized not only in the conventional biological way, but also by the pollen from a Mexican indigenous cactus plant. So she's double insemination, if you like, and so here she's struggling with this Mexican identity. Behind her, her parents, of course, and there on the left of the screen at the top there, we can see her mother, who was from Spanish colonial stock, European entirely, and there is her native Mexican father, gr uh, grandfather. On the other side, the Hungarian gentleman in, in his uh, European moustache there is her, uh, her paternal grandfather, and there, her paternal grandmother, from whom she inherited her eyebrows, uh, which meet in the middle there. And now she rejoices in the luxuriant produce of the Mexican soil, but undoubtedly with a phallic element here. You can see she's a highly charged uh, lady. And in addition, she's painted two corn cobs. Why corn cobs? This is a political painting because not the produce of the land was key to the revolutionaries in 1910 to 1920. And as their emblem, they had a flag with a corn cob on it as their uh, uh, logo, as you will, uh, if you will. And now she paints herself again, taking the milk of Mother Mexico before the conquest. 
her milk from the breast of a pre-Columbian Mexican deity here, as you can see. And this painting was uh, sent to New York um, in the uh, Julian Levy Gallery in New York. And there, Edward G. Robinson, the celebrated 1930s Hollywood actor, sees the painting and buys it for $200. Frida goes to New York for the opening, seems to have some magnetic attraction to Levy himself, the gallery owner, and they have an affair uh, which is the source of trouble down the road, as you can imagine. Meanwhile, André Breton, the father of the surrealist movement in Paris, visits Mexico, and he immediately hails Frida as the archetypal surrealist painter. And she says, absolutely not. Surrealists paint their dreams. I paint my experiences. A subtle distinction. She eventually goes to Paris and meets all the surrealists because eventually the show that he had promised her comes about. She meets the surrealist and uh, with one exception, um, she, uh, Marcel Duchamp, she thought all of the surrealists were completely cuckoo. <laughs> but she does paintings which I think you would regard as surrealist paintings. Here she is in bed, in, in, entwined in the vine of the native Mexican soil, which is so dear to her. And on the top of the bed, the four-poster bed her father bought her when she was convalescing from the bus accident, where she painted herself with a mirror, you remember, she paints herself as a skeleton. And the skeleton, you can see, is laced with sticks of dynamite. And this is a reference to the way André Breton described her work to her surrealist, his surrealist colleagues. She said, Frida Kahlo paints like a ribbon around a bomb. And I thought that's a very succinct uh, description of her work, as we're going to see. And here's another surreal painting, again, what I saw in my bath, uh, various images that float through her mind. Diego now finds out, whereas before we saw the blood spattered Frida, having found out about Diego's affair with Christina, her older sister, now Diego finds out about her affair with Levy, the New York gallery owner. And he divorces her. No nonsense. There she is, liberated. She cuts her hair and she wears a man's suit and paints this self-portrait of her now, her hair all on the ground there, as you can see, but holding a pair of scissors strategically placed so Diego would have no doubt as to where she was coming from. <laughs> And in case you still had any doubt, she now paints herself as a martyr, not with a crown of thorns, but with a necklace of thorns, and on her shoulders, spider monkeys, the Mexican symbol for virility. So this was uh, an equal push and pull. Neither one nor the other was going to dominate uh, the sexual argument. But now the injuries from her bus accident were really beginning to take a toll. And now she's in a lot of pain and she's on alcohol, she's taking drugs and everything is all a bit blurry. And she finally agrees to go to New York for surgery where she has rods put in her spine with bone grafting which helps her pain to only some extent. And now she paints herself as a wounded deer, but she wears male deer antlers. She's cheered up a little bit in spite of her pain uh, by the fact that she's now been elected to the very prestigious Mexican uh, uh, Hall of Culture. It's a very elite group of artists and she's elected a member of that and is also now granted a professorship at the Mexican Academy of Art with her own students but is really too ill to uh, see them in the, uh, at the gallery and they come to her home where she gives them instruction. Death has often featured in uh, Frida Kahlo's work, and here she's taking nourishment from entrails, chicken, you can see, fish, and she's take, trying to get nourishment from, from Mexico, and she calls this painting No Hope. And she painted earlier for the American uh, diplomat Claire Luce Booth, She'd had a friend, uh, Hale, Dorothy Hale, who had committed suicide some time earlier, and she wanted a painting from Frida Kahlo to commemorate her friend. And to Claire Luce Booth's horror, this is what Frida produced, the actual moment that uh, her friend actually comes falling out of her skyscraper and dies. She was so horrified at this that she returned it to Frida, paid her for it, but couldn't accept the painting. Frida had also painted 
pictures here a child in a death mask, no doubt commemorating the various fetuses that she had aborted on the way. And now the gangrene in her leg was affecting her to the point that she required a right, below knee, a right through knee amputation and was now confined to a wheelchair. And here she is painting the one physician whose painkillers seemed to be doing some good. But she was very depressed, contemplating suicide, and in her diary she wrote, I don't think I will go through with it because Diego will miss me. <laughs> Extraordinary. She now paints herself as a Madonna yet again, like the Louvre painting that we saw earlier. And there's Diego always on her mind, painting herself as a Tejuana woman. Tejuana is a province of Mexico, a state of within Mexico uh, Republic, in which it's a matriarchal society. So she felt very comfortable there uh, with that, and very much like the patron saint of Mexico there, the Virgin of Guadalupe. And here she finally finds peace. She begins in this final painting that she does, she reconciles herself with pre-Columbian Mexican. There's the pre-Columbian Mexican goddess from whose breast she was taking nourishment, you remember. And here she is embraced by the Mexican goddess, one arm black, the other arm white, and, and uh, Frida herself, uh, a color between the two. So she did reconcile herself eventually to her racial identity, but it took a long time to reach that point. And then in 1954, 11 days after accompanying her husband on a socialist uh, uh, protest in Mexico City, Diego goes to her room to find that she is in bed, dead. And on her bedside table, an empty box of pills. She's laid uh, out to rest. She's given a, um, a state of honor in the Mexican Museum of Art, National Gallery, is cremated and her ashes are then placed in a pre-Columbian vase, which is then placed in her studio, which is now the Frida Kahlo Museum in Mexico City, which you may have visited or may feel inclined to do so. What about Diego himself as a painter? As Frida had conflicts about her identity, Diego had no doubts at all as to who he was. He was from Spanish settler stock over many generations, and he took it upon himself to find out as much as he could about pre-Columbian, uh, before pre-conquest Mexico to learn where his adopted country and to respect the history of his adopted country. And this was his main motivation. He studied what he could of uh, pre-Columbian life here, as you can see, and even going as far as uh, finding archive material that gave him an idea of what the Aztec capital city of Tenochtitlan, which is now where Mexico City stands, uh, was actually like. And this is a mural that he subsequently did indicating this, and he made copious notes uh, in order to construct this mural painting. Mexico City, as you may know, sits in a, in a basin surrounded by mountains all the way around, and that was the original Aztec capital replete with its Aztec temples, its causeways, and elaborate system of canals. He visits archaeological sites and takes copious notes of the actual buildings there to incorporate into his murals, visits the archaeological museum, and here is the best preserved and eight-foot store statue of one of the pantheon of Mexican gods, Coatlicu, who is the mother goddess of the mother creator. And here she is, and he makes detailed notes of her form in this uh, contemporary Aztec statue. And then, of course, studies the Aztec calendar that uh, greets you as you enter the Mexican Museum. Their large, eight-foot round uh, stone-carved uh, uh, calendar in which the Aztecs had divided up their year into 18 months of 20 days each, and then to complete the cycle at five days at the end. So quite a sophisticated society. And then there is this very striking stone monument here. It's quite small. It's the back of a little shrine. And on the back, you can just about make out there an eagle. And the eagle is standing on a cactus plant, devouring a snake. And this will appear on the Mexican Republic flag uh, once the country receive, uh, obtains its freedom from Spain. And according to Aztec legend, where this site would be seen, an eagle devouring a snake perched on a cactus plant, would be a propitious site for the Aztecs to build their capital. And that's uh, why it's such a seminal um, image uh, for uh, Mexico. Thirty years after Columbus made landfall in America, 
This is the state of understanding of the coast of America. You can see the southern half of the North America there, the, the, uh, where Mexico is, the eastern end, of the western end of the Caribbean, Central America, and all these little lines, dotted lines, are settlements within 30 years. And of course, the Spanish conquest was the most important single event in Mexican history, which would profoundly influence Diego Rivera's work. Some settlers had already settled there from, from Spain, and word got back to the Spanish kingdom that there was gold to be found in the hinterland of what we now call Mexico at the uh, western end of the Caribbean there. And so the Spanish monarchy then sent for Hernan Cordes, who was a lawyer and administrator in Spanish Cuba. And he was charged with forming an expeditionary force to land in Mexico to see if there was indeed gold to be had as the early coastal settlers thought there might be or, or knew there was, in fact. And so he assembles a dozen ships, a hundred men, horses and cannon, and sets off in 18, in 15, uh, 19, uh, and lands in where the Yucatan Peninsula now is in Mexico, and uh, sends uh, he there, befriends or seeks a guide because he cannot speak the native language, and the local settlers have identified for him a woman who has learned Spanish from the settlers, who speaks Nanahuatl, the native language of Mexico, and would also act as his guide. Uh, her name was Melinche, and she becomes the maternal figure uh, for the Mexican people, insofar as not only was she the guide and interpreter, but she also became Hernan Her Cortes's mistress on the three months that it took him to reach Tenochtitlan, the capital city of the Aztecs. And not only did she become his mistress, she subsequently gave birth to his child, who is now even today regarded as the prototype of the new Mexican, the combination of the white and the native. He arrives in Tenochtitlan, but before he gets there, the king of the Aztecs, Montezuma II, gets word that there is this white man coming with followers, and at the same time, he sees a comet in the sky, which he regards as a good omen. And so he thinks that this is a messenger from the serpent tail, feathered serpent god, because of the tail of the comet, and that the serpent god always brings good news. And so he prepares for Cortes and his army a reception, a banquet, and gifts of gold. As Cortes arrives and is greeted in such a manner, he gets word that some of the settlers on the coast had been murdered by the local native people. Whereupon, Cortes then arrests Moctezuma, and there is a dialogue between them, and the compromise they come to is that Moctezuma will continue to be the figurehead king, but will report to Cortes, who is the overlord of this new territory that he's on the point of conquering. Six months after that compromise is entered into, Moctezuma is mysteriously killed. That causes an uprising, the Mexicans are driven out, and then what Cortes does is regroups, gets reinforcements from the Caribbean, and then takes back the Tenochtitlan capital city with his army, lays it to siege, then destroys it completely, and with the aid of a tribe nearby, friendly and supportive, the Mexica people, he then builds his own capital, which he calls Mexico City, which is in fact the capital now of the Mexican New Mexico, the New Spain. Part of the brief from the Spanish monarchy was not only to conquer territory in the name of the Spanish crown, but also to Christianize the population. So following close on the um, the conquest, which was complete over the whole of the Mexican territory within two years, missionaries now arrived. These were um, uh, Benedictine and uh, uh, other uh, friars who came to Christianize the local population. And this painting is particularly interesting because it shows Cortes kneeling in prayer before a friar in front of the Aztec elders. Why? to demonstrate that even he, the great conqueror, 
is in awe of the priest and that he is the one who is really powerful and he will therefore Christianize these people because, and they would think to themselves that clearly if Cortes is going to submit to the priest, then they, likewise they should do the same. And that was successful. And so Christianity came to Spain. Wave upon waves of missionaries then arrived to Christianize the villagers by baptism, queuing up to do so. And here there's another, a scholar friar who comes now, um, uh, Bernardino of Sahuan, who is a, a scholar who wants to understand the Aztec people better in order to reconcile their beliefs with Christianity to make their conversions more genuine and meaningful to them. So he tries to research out from their artifacts and from their uh, religious uh, documents and uh, cultural artifacts uh, something about their life, only to discover that the Mexican army had really essentially destroyed all remnants of Mexican life. So he sets about himself to explore as much as he can for the next 23 years. He compiles a, an encyclopedia of pre conquest Aztec life, pre-Columbian Aztec life, getting local artists to draw illustrations. And here, there, in the 12 volumes, he covers the flora, the fauna, the cultural habits, the dressing habits, the cultivation of maize, the painting of bird feathers, all the things the Mexican do. Uh, do. And then he writes it all out on one side of the page in Spanish and on the other side in Nahuatl, respecting the native language. And this becomes an important document for Diego Rivera to refer to when he comes to do his murals. 200 years after Columbus, this is what Americas looked like. Everything in blue is Spanish, can you believe? From Alaska in the north, almost as far as Russia and the Bering Strait, all the way down to the tip of, Mex of Chile and uh, Argentina. And here we can see in 19, 1821, taking a guide from the American Revolution of 1776, driving out the British, the French Revolution in 1789, driving out the French uh, monarchy, the, Span the Mexicans now drive out their Spanish overlords and establish a republic. And there is the symbol that we saw on the back of that uh, stone there the eagle on a cactus plant, and that's now incorporated in the flag of the Mexican Republic. But Mexican Republic was really poorly run. It was really, they were not used to this, and it didn't go well for the next 10 years or so, with uh, coup after coup trying to establish a central government. And this is the extent of Mexico at the, at the time of the independence from Spain in 1821, extending right up to the top there where the white is, all the way down, a good chunk of what's now United States, the whole of Central America, all the way down to South America. Because the borders were very badly patrolled, Amer United States citizens were looking for new room. This was the expansion towards the West, you remember, and a lot of them settled down in the Mexican province of Tejas, T-E-G-A-S, T-E-J-A-S. Mexican province of Tejas was hardly patrolled at all. It was an empty space, and United States citizens settled down there and eventually took it upon themselves to declare themselves the independent state of Texas. The Mexicans thought this was a, a, an unacceptable affront, sent their army in to retake the Amer the, what the Americans had now claimed as their own state, uh, and this led the United States Army to come into Mexico, eventually occupying a Mexico City, and the whole country was basically uh, in economic ruin as a result of a war that lasted for several years. As a consequence of that war, the Mexicans agreed to sell to the United States the whole of Alto California, which is now the state of California, of New Mexico, as well as Texas, for the princely sum of $15 million. Mexico was hugely in debt to Europeans to try to finance the getting the new state off the ground, in debt to Spain, uh, to France, and to Britain. And the European powers, now that uh, Mexico was really prostate and reduced just to the green area there with a little bit of the Yucatan, the, the Europeans demanded that they have a say in the governance of this country in which they were owed so much money. And they did so by an arrangement with the uh, uh, emperor of Austria-Hungary, who had a nephew, Maximilian. 
And through the intervention of Napoleon III, who was the, the, the uh, Emperor of France at the time, it was agreed that Maximilian would go to Mexico as the king of the Mexicans in order to try to stabilize the, the country economically. And he did. For six years, he instituted major economic reforms. The country really seemed to have a central government for the first time since independence. But he overreached himself in that he was absolutely ruthless and would brook no opposition to the point that he not only imprisoned people who crossed him, but he also had them executed. And eventually, this was too much for the population, the Mexicans, and they arrested him, put him on trial, and he was executed in this painting by Edward uh, 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 Manet, commemorating the execution of Maximilian uh, I of Mexico, which I'm, a painting with which I'm sure you're familiar. Then a strong man was needed. This is Porfirio Diaz, who for 27 years got Mexico back on the track, but he did so by bringing in American investment, is instituting a government of technocrats and, build, and building infrastructure, roads, railways, dams, canals, irrigation system for the fields. Mexico, for the first time, was really beginning to prosper. But he made one fatal mistake. And that was he confiscated all the native lands, which really he regarded as open land, not really belonging to anybody. And he uh, accumulated the lands into parcels, large chunks of Mexico were then given to three or four families who ran the agricultural side of Mexico. And of course, that left the entire native population without their native land. And this was, of course, the, the beginning of the 1910 revolution and it was over land reform. And this is a topic that is uh, familiar to us all even today. And the revolutionaries here, Pancho Villa and, uh, and uh, 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 his accomplices there with the bandoliers, negotiate with the government, but the negotiations break down and there's a 10 year period of civil war in Mexico. Frida, who was born in 1910, she claimed that because she identified so strongly with the Mexican Revolution, she did two things. Frida had changed her name from Frida, F-R-I-E-D-A, to Frida, F-R-I-D-A, in order to de-emphasize her European roots. And she also changed unofficially her birthday, not from 1907 when she was born, but to 1910, the year that the revolution broke out. This was her way of identifying with the revolution. But the revolution was eventually successful, land was reappropriated to the people, and a new uh, regime uh, was established. Diego Rivera, meanwhile, had set out the revolution, not intentionally, because in 1909, a year before the revolution really got underway, he had gone to Europe, to Madrid, and then on to Paris to further his career as a painter. And there he paints two uh, Japanese artists he had met, met uh, borrowing the Cubist idiom that was all the fashion at the time. But he knew what was going on in Mexico because he was very passionate about knowing about Mexican life. And here he paints Zapata, one of the leaders of the Mexican Revolution there. He does it in a Cubist painting here. The rifle, you can see the Mexican blanket over his shoulder, the eye of Zapata, and there on the right, a stylized cactus plant. Diego then goes off to Rome, sponsored by the Mexican ambassador uh, in, uh, in Paris. And he goes off to Rome and studies intensely Michelangelo's solid heroic looking figures that adorn the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel, the frescoes. And then in the stanza, the library of the Vatican, he sees Raphael's pictures here of crowds of figures here on the hill of Mark Parnassus. And these two images sear into him as to how he's going to direct his career as a muralist. The solidity of Michelangelo and the density of the, pop of the people portrayed on the frescoes of Raphael. Back in Mexico, now he returns in 1921, the, re the, the new enlightened socialist regime institutes a program of public building paintings. And, and Diego is one of the three leading Mexican painters who are commissioned to do murals in public buildings in order to foster an identity of, na of nationhood in this new Mexican society. 
And the first commission that he has is in the National Preparatory School, which uh, Frida Kahlo was fortunate to be one of 35 girls to go to, which Diego Rivera, a generation before, had also been a pupil, as had the Minister of Education who was commissioning these murals. And this is an auditorium of, in that school, in Di what Diego's first mural for that uh, big uh, commission to forge Mexican identity. And the various figures on, you see man triumphant rising out of the soil of Mexico there. And on either side, you can see dark skinned figures, light skinned figures, but the majority are brown skinned figures. These are the new Mexican people harking back to the child that Hernan Cortes's mistress, Melinche, had given birth to the product of the native Mexican and the white settler. And this was Diego Rivera's recognition in the same way that Frida was identifying herself as a product of, of two different uh, cultures. And now Diego does these Michelangelo-like studies for his murals, and here a flower carrier imbued with the dignity of a Michelangelo uh, painting, as you can see. And when Frida was accompanying Diego, you remember, to Cuernavaca, where his commission was for two years to paint the story of Mexico from the conquest until the 1910 revolution. That was the gift of the American ambassador to Mexico who wanted to make up for bad relations that had followed the American-Mexican War. So he paid for Cortes's palace in Cuernavaca to be painted with a mural. And the mural, this is part of the mural that uh, uh, to Diego does for that palace, and he holds no punches. Diego is a straight shooter. If he doesn't like what happened, he says so. He doesn't sort of just pretty around it all. And he paints human sacrifices that the Aztec carried out, which the Christian converters abolished, to their credit, of course. But also, he paints burning at the stake of heretics uh, with, with Catholic priests there uh, presiding over the ceremony. So he holds no punches at all as to where he's coming from. Meanwhile, he received now as the most senior of the mural painters, established his reputation, a massive commission that would last 20 years, 16 years, I'm sorry, 16 years to paint murals for the National Palace. This was the original Royal Palace in Mexico. It now flanks the big Zocalo in Mexico City, which you may have seen. One side, the National Palace, huge building. And Diego's commission, which would last for 16 years, was to paint murals for the entrance hall, the staircase, public rooms, and the courtyard beyond. And he would do so by painting now the history of Mexico, not as he'd done in Guadalajara, which was the history of Mexico from the conquest to 1910, but the pre-Aztec Mexico through the conquest to the present time. And again, he pulls no punches. This is, a page, this is one wall from his mural in the, in the National Palace. And you can see it really is the subtext of this mural will be the exploitation of the Aztecs by the conquistadors. Right at the bottom there, you can see a, 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 a transaction going on, money bags being exchanged, and a man there with a ledger entering the proceeds into his ledger there with his black top hat. And while that's going on, you can see a soldier there in armor at the bottom left-hand side with a sash across his armor, his visor lifted, holding a branding iron, and he's branding the forehead of a native Mexican. As if that isn't enough, look at the top right-hand side there, a man wielding a whip, can you see, as these poor uh, Aztec uh, uh, fellows are trying to struggle with this huge log, and those that didn't please the overseer are suspended from a tree in the background. And overseeing the whole scene through the eyes of Diego Rivera is at the top left-hand corner there, a crucifix and a friar seems to be blessing the whole scene. So this is a man who says it how he sees it. And here, he idealizes, to some extent, the Aztecs in another panel in the, in the National Palace. This is Aztec life before the conquest. We've seen the exploitation, now Aztec life before the conquest. And if you look right at the top there, near the right, where this uh, orange tree is, a man on the top of the cliff there with a bow and arrow, can you see? And there you can see others in the river there panning for gold. And down on the left-hand side there, you can see the elaborate painted feathered headdresses of the uh, ceremony about to take place by the Aztec elders, while the women folk on the right there are preparing a celebratory meal. 
And here, another panel in which we see the local crafts at work. And there you can see the feather painters at the bottom there, others painting ceramic bowls, cloth, and raising the rim on the right-hand side there of a clay pot. And here's Diego's, one of Diego's uh, main projects now back in the States. He's in America, you remember. Uh, Frida is with him there. And this is the commission that he had while Frida was parading herself around as a Mexican artifact attracting a lot of attention trying to find herself as an artist. Diego was working now at the, at the Detroit Institute of Art. 27 panels with the, age, with the help of two, seven assistants over the course of two years. And this was a commission by the Ford Motor Company, because Ford headquarters is in Dearborn, Michigan, as I'm sure you know. And there, uh, Edsel Ford, who was the president of the Ford Motor Corporation, commissioned Diego Rivera to a for a mural for the Art Museum and indicating progress.